Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On December 4th and 5th, we went to Mexico City to interview some of the brightest entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're really excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes with links and contact info to everyone we speak with can be found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. If you want to save 5 to 20% off of everything at Amazon using Bitcoin and support Liberty Entrepreneurs with no cost to you, check out the show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and sign up for an account with purse.io using our affiliate link. Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. We are still here at day two of the Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Mexico City. We're joined by Pamela Morgan, attorney, educator, and entrepreneur who founded two Bitcoin-based businesses, Empowered Law, which is a Bitcoin-centric law firm, and Third Key Solutions, which is a multi-sig key management software company. She is certified Ice House Entrepreneurship teacher and formerly a trainer for the program, which assists college professors on how to better teach entrepreneurship. Pamela, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here talking with you. So can you fill in the gaps here on the bio and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Prior to finding Bitcoin in late of 2013, I was employed by the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program and I was teaching educators how to teach entrepreneurship. Tell us a little bit about what the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program is. Certainly. The Ice House Entrepreneurship Program is about looking at how we actually develop entrepreneurship skills and helping students and pretty much everyone develop those skills within themselves so that they can be successful. I think the key differentiation between the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program is that they focus on developing the entrepreneurial mindset and not on developing a business plan. So give us a background. How did the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program start and what is it? Um, Well, the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program, I came about, let me me tell you about how I found the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program. I was the program director for uh, business administration and entrepreneurship for a community college in Chicago. And I went to a conference, much like this, and there was someone there talking about the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program and talking about this new way to get students excited and interested in entrepreneurship and to actually make them successful. And so I was all about it. And I sat in on a... um, on a talk about metrics on how successful the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program was. And I heard statistics like 70% of students said, this is the best class I've ever taken in college. Um, They were saying things like, I wish I knew this uh, five years ago. Why aren't they teaching this to kids? Things like that. Students were who were formerly uh, dropping out students who were not successful in college all of a sudden becoming invigorated and excited and interested in entrepreneurship and in actually creating new lives for themselves. So it's an interesting name, Ice House. Where did that come from? So the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program came from a a book and the book is called The Ice House Entrepreneur and it's available on Amazon. Um, It's pretty inexpensive and it's that's the core of the Ice House Entrepreneurship course. This program came from a man called Clifton Talbert who uh, grew up in the segregated South. I believe it was in the 1950s. Um, could be slightly earlier in in the South. And his uncle owned an ice owned the ice house. And at that point, people didn't have refrigeration in the South. And so everyone had to get their ice to cool their their food from the centralized ice house. And Clifton Talbert's uncle owned the ice house. And so because he had a good that the community needed, he was one of the few people that could actually interact with all of the other people in the community, regardless of race or religion or any of the other factors that typically segregated people at that time. That's really interesting because that is the market, right? You've got a good and people need you and they need that voluntary, mutually beneficial type of relationships. And it really eliminates a lot of uh, discrimination. Absolutely. And it, and it provides opportunities. And there are opportunities where people don't necessarily recognize them. And when you're, when you're delivering something to the community of value, something that, that speaks to a basic 
uh, human good. Everyone needs that. So tell us a little bit more about the Ice House program and your experience with it. Certainly. So I wanted to uh, implement this in my college. You know, I, I was so excited about what I could bring to my students. My students were typically um, Chicago Public Schools uh, graduates, and they were first-time, first-generation college students. Uh, many of them uh, didn't even know entrepreneurs, and so I would often have them go out and, and meet entrepreneurs in their communities, and that would be a, a, a task that I would give them. You know, hey, if you want to study this, if you want to be like this, you need to have some mentors. You need to know other people who are doing what you want to do, and so I would encourage them to do that. So when I became certified as an Ice House uh, entrepreneur teacher, um, at that certification, the CEO at the time, who's not the CEO anymore, um, but the co-author of the book, Gary Shoniger, asked me if I would come and work for him and teach teachers how to implement this program. And I said, absolutely. So not only were you teaching your students how to become an entrepreneur and the importance of just networking and understanding entrepreneurship in general, you were also training other teachers and professors on how to do the same thing. Absolutely, and I think the major difference with the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program than other programs is that there's this problem in college, um, some call it bureaucracy, uh, it, it moves very slowly. And we've been teaching, we as, as, you know, as the academy, as academia, have been teaching entrepreneurship as you need to write a business plan. Nothing will kill creativity faster than having a student sit down and write a business plan when they don't have an MVP, when they actually haven't actually even tested their idea out on the market. Really what we need to do is flip that around. There's a lot of talk in education about experiential learning, and we know now that people don't learn when you're talking at them, but they learn from experiences. And so that's what this program, the, the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program does, is it brings those kinds of experiential learning opportunities to college classrooms. So what are some of the tactics that you'd recommend to new entrepreneurs to get towards that goal of an MVP? There are a lot, there are a lot of resources available online that are free of charge. Um, if you're, you know, if you're not familiar with a business model canvas, you should look at those. Um, they're great and they're a great thinking tool. Uh, obviously, you know, I'd recommend reading the Ice House Entrepreneurship book um, just because I, I think it's a great resource. It's, it, and it's interesting. Um, the perspective is there. And one of the core takeaways is, and I don't want to ruin it for you, uh, but one of the core takeaways from, from the book is that, you know, if Clifton Talbert and his uncle could do this in the middle of the segregated South with no money, no VC backing, no opportunity, no education, you know, his uncle didn't have an education, but he was able to do this anyway. If they were able to do it, why can't you? What's holding you back? And let's identify that what really holds most of us back is fear. So from a uh, creating an entrepreneurial mindset, Liberty Entrepreneurs, our podcast, is trying to do just that. What advice for us would you have as far as how do we most effectively foster that, that mindset? I think giving people encouragement, giving them, number one, giving them tools that they can work with that are easy to use, that are valuable. And when I say valuable, I mean valuable to developing their, their mindset, valuable to bringing their product to market, valuable to allowing them to learn on how they can um, take their ideas. L let me give you an example of, I'm going to give you an example of what not to do, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what to do. So when I was teaching, um, when I was at the, back up, sorry. Um, when I was uh, training and tr when I was training other teachers to teach the the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program, um, we would have it would it would be a, typically a three day training, and the the first night we would have everyone come in and kind of do a networking and cocktail and 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 talk amongst themselves and kind of coalesce the group because that's important when you really want to do good work you want to create again we go back to the idea of fear and a lot of times people won't voice their opinion if they're afraid and so you know obviously one way to to prevent that is to do an icebreaker and have people talk so this woman was proudly explaining to to the rest of the table how um, she was teaching entrepreneurship and there was a student that she had who wanted to create uh, or who wanted to make $250 handbags. And this woman was from a rural community in Kansas, and this teacher didn't see any market for that. And so she was proudly explaining to the rest of the group how she told this student that, you know, there's no market for that, and you, you're never going to make it. And 
at that point, you have to stop and say, wait, what? Are you the market? How do you know what the market is? And I think a lot of times when we start talking to people about our ideas, they inevitably want to protect us from ourselves. And so they say things, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, that discourage us from, from pursuing. And we take their opinion and we allow that to stop us from moving forward, when in reality, many of the people that we talk to aren't really our market anyway. And so I think if you're going to try to bring something to market and if you're going to try to be an entrepreneur, you know, I think that creating that MVP, and when I say MVP, I mean really MVP, like it doesn't have to be anything other than something that people can get an idea, like put their arms around, put their mind around, put their hands around. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. And don't take the first no. And don't take the first 10 no's. Instead of staying at no, you should ask, why not? Yeah. What could I do to make this valuable to you? It, it, that's, I think, the key question. And I think that's what different, differentiates people that actually become entrepreneurs from those who are on the couch and thinking about, man, I wish I could have my own business. You know, it's, it's, it's listening to those no's and it's not being able to develop the idea and get feedback and, and get reasonable feedback. One question you can ask is, okay, if this isn't valuable to you, what would be valuable to you? Where's your problem? Identifying that problem, identifying that pain point and being able to solve that and actually bring real value is what's gonna get you it's, it's actually what's going to allow you to develop a business. Yeah, that, that is definitely the mindset of an entrepreneur is, okay, so you don't see value in this right now. Where do you see value? Where could you see value? Because, you know, it doesn't mean that I see value in the same place, but let me just have that curiosity and get your feedback. Someone who may not be my ideal client, but you could be a client. So just tell me what would make my product more interesting to you? Um, so what keeps you busy these days? What takes up most of your time? I spend a lot of time traveling. I spend a lot of time uh, speaking at conferences, which I love to do. When I'm not speaking at conferences, I am developing my businesses. So I'm either working in uh, as a lawyer, but most of the time today I'm working on Third Key Solutions, which is this Bitcoin blockchain-based business. Yeah, tell us more about that. Well, Third Key Solutions is a, a company that's focused on backup and recovery in the Bitcoin space. And that's really important. You know, we talked earlier about identifying a problem. We identified pretty early on that there's a problem in this industry, and that's that people aren't really focused on recovery. They're focused on protecting their keys, but they're not focused on how do I recover my Bitcoin if something bad happens. So on an individual level, you can have a solution like a multi-signature wallet, right? Where you have uh, additional parties and maybe you have another key stored somewhere else. But on an enterprise level, right? What happens if your wallet company is holding one of, one of the keys? And what happens if they're compromised? How do we recover funds on a big scale for a whole tree? And how do we do it in a way that is timely, that's not too costly, um, that is in line with customer expectations? And how do we really infuse consumer protection into these sorts of things that, that we're developing? Right. How did you get the motivation or how did you get the idea to create this type of company? Reluctantly, actually, <laughs> um, you know, I, I was I was operating full time in the Bitcoin space as an attorney and I was helping startups kind of navigate the waters, um, particularly in corporate governance and developing um, developing uh, separation of duties and those sorts of things within the company, right? So really focused on internal operations, strategic and internal operations, and how are we going to secure your Bitcoin? And you know, I, I got started in this when there were a lot of problems with, for example, Mt. Gox, where you had people running away with money. And, and there are a number of different examples of principals and companies running away with money. And so I was working, and I, and I still tend to work with very, very early stage startups in the Bitcoin space. So uh, I don't tend to work with people who are already VC funded or angel funded. I tend to work with people who either do just have angel funding or are trying to get angel funding or trying to get VC funding. And how I do that is I help them develop these, these governance um, plans. And so 
I kept getting asked over and over again by my clients, will you, will you hold the third key for us? And I would say, no way, I'm not doing that. That's way too risky, you know, and, and, and I'm an attorney. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not a technology specialist, although I, I think I know enough to be dangerous. Um, my undergrad degree, my undergraduate degree is in business administration and computer programming. So before I went to law school, I was a computer nerd. I uh, still am. But, you know, I, I'm not a programmer in the Bitcoin space. And so I, I felt like this isn't something that I should do. And after being asked over and over again by my clients, I thought, well, this is the market telling me that there is a need. And so let's explore it. Let's see what. Can I, can I solve this need? Let, let me talk to some smart people. And so I started talking to people in the industry and together we developed third key solutions. Let's wrap up with what personality traits help someone get into the mindset required to be a successful entrepreneur. I think at the core, anyone can be an entrepreneur. I think that when we're little, when we're young, we're excited and we're creative and we look at ways we look at problems and we see them as opportunities and we and we have all of those traits so i think that everyone is born with an entrepreneurial spirit i think that sometimes circumstance and formal education and experience tells us that those aren't valuable qualities right they tell us that creativity or going off on your own or trying things differently isn't valued and so um we look at risk and we say okay, you could be an entrepreneur or you could go be an accountant. And if you're an accountant, you're going to get a good job and it's going to be steady and you're going to have a steady paycheck and you know, you're going to put in your 20, 30, 40 years. And at the end of the day, maybe you'll get to retire and maybe you'll get to do things. And you know, that's that old mindset. And I think that given today's economic, you know, I mean, g given where we are economically in the world, I think we all know that that's not true anymore. I think that we all, I don't personally, I don't know anyone who's counting on a retirement package. I don't know anyone who is planning to stay at their job for a decade. No one I know stays at jobs for decades. Um, and so this is a totally different mindset. And so now we're starting to see that things like risk taking and creativity becoming valued. I think another thing that may, be, that, that may be relevant to your listeners is that one of the discoveries in the Ice House Entrepreneurship Project was this idea that as you start to grow and as you start a, a small business, it, it begins to grow and it gr goes through the product life cycle, right? Which is, you know, the, the initial stages and then the growth and then the maturity and then the obsolescence. And so you can see the growth cycle in things like fax machines, right? So, or in things like landlines or, or things like laptops. Um, so you can look at, you know, the, the growth cycle. When companies get so large, they can no longer innovate because they become too big. And so then they become innovators by acquiring other companies or other ideas. And so I think that we undervalue, you know, I think that there's a there's an observation bias in that we undervalue innovative qualities of people and we we try to stifle that as academia. So we say things like, you know, you must be tried, you know, must be tried and true. Don't be risky. You know, don't take unnecessary risks. Well, what are unnecessary risks? You know, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Earlier today, you know, Trace, Trace was talking about, you know, w what can you do? When they, were, they asked him a question about, you know, how, how do you secure your Bitcoin and how do you balance Bitcoin security with, um, you know, with ease of use? And... Trace mentioned, you know, well, if you have $100 worth of Bitcoin or if you have $50 worth of Bitcoin, you're going to secure it in a way that's different than if you have 1000 or 10000 And that makes sense. But I think sometimes we don't recognize that $50 worth of Bitcoin is actually a lot to a lot of people. You know, that, that $50 is, is, it could be everything to them. And so I think that it's all a matter of perspective and how we, how we look at things and where we're looking at things from. And I think that if we can stop for a second and, and move past the fear we can really innovate. And I think surrounding yourself with people who are innovating and, and knowing and, and, and really just talking to people and not being afraid to communicate with them and not being afraid to fail. Um, I'm sure you guys have talked about this before, but all great, and all great entrepreneurs have failed at least once. A and failure is not a failure of, of you as a person. 
It's a failure of possibly the market. It could be a failure of, of the solution that you're providing. For example, maybe you're not actually providing a, a real solution that people need. But I think a lot of times we view failure as me personally. I, I the person, have failed. And I think that that's, I think that that's detrimental to the entrepreneurial spirit. And I think if we can move away from that, we can actually foster entrepreneurship in a lot more people. Pamela Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. 